Hello grade tens and welcome to this series on magnetism. Scientists have spent years on the investigation of materials in the attempt to develop useful applications. A better understanding of the special properties that make each material useful helps us to choose the right material for a particular design or purpose. Let's join Diasha as we further investigate the applications of magnetism. Magnetic materials are all around us and play a very important part in our modern world. But do you know what I mean when I use the term magnetic material? Let's start today's lesson by looking at a definition for this important term. Materials that experience a force of attraction when brought close to a magnet are called magnetic materials. So, what do you know about magnets? Most of you will have played around with magnets and should already know that they attract metal objects. Although magnets are used to make simple toys, they also form part of technology that has changed the world over the last hundred years. Here are some examples of the sometimes surprising and unusual places magnets and magnetic materials are found. A fridge magnet holds all those important notices in place, but the fridge door also stays shut because of the magnets inside the seal. You probably enjoy listening to music. So, guess what you'll find inside every loudspeaker you ever see? A very powerful magnet. In fact, computers are very sensitive to magnets because data on the machine is stored on magnetic material. Money makes the world go round and no one will deny that ATMs have made our lives a lot more convenient. But did you know that every time you use a bank card, you make use of a magnetic material? The strip at the back of the card carries the information about your bank account in a magnetic arrangement. This information is read each time a card is swiped through a card machine. Some vending machines even identify the coins you insert based on their magnetic properties. It is clear that magnetism plays an important role in modern day technology. But where does it come from? This is a simple question, but it is not as easy to answer as you might think. Magnetism is one of the Earth's great mysteries, and scientists only really started understanding and explaining it in the last 350 years. But magnetism was first discovered about 3,000 years ago. Let us look at some naturally magnetic materials from the periodic table. So, which elements are magnetic then? Let me show you on the periodic table. Of the metals, the ones that have magnetic properties are iron, nickel and cobalt. And more recently, scientists have found that some of the rare earth metals, like neodymium and samarium, also show some significant magnetic properties. In fact, some of the strongest magnets available today are NDFEB magnets. These were first produced in 1984. They contain the rare earth element neodymium, iron and the semi-metal boron. A mixture of these elements is processed and baked in an oven. These ceramic magnets are then magnetized using electricity. Now what about the non-metals? Do any of these elements have magnetic properties? Surprisingly, oxygen actually has some magnetic properties. Isn't that incredible? Did you ever imagine that oxygen would be a magnetic material? There doesn't appear to be any pattern to predict which elements are magnetic and which are non-magnetic. And when the elements that we have identified combine, they form a whole variety of magnetic materials. To answer the question of why some elements have magnetic properties and others don't, let's look inside the materials at an atomic level to investigate the arrangements of these particles. This might help us to understand the properties better. Let's begin by recapping what we know about the basic model of matter. You should recall that matter is made from very small particles. The smallest building block of matter is called an atom. 
Atoms of different elements have different size and mass. Remember, the atoms of each element have different numbers of subatomic particles. There are three basic subatomic particles in an atom. The proton, neutron and electron. The proton is positively charged and the neutron is neutral. The protons and neutrons are found in the nucleus of the atom. They give the atom its mass. The electron is negatively charged. Electrons are not found close to the nucleus, but are contained in orbitals of different energy. The electrons are continually moving within these regions of space around the nucleus. In the late 1800s, a man by the name of Ersted discovered that a moving charge causes a magnetic effect. Well, it made scientists realize that there must be a connection between magnetism and the movement of charged particles. And where do we find moving charged particles? That's it, inside the orbitals of the atom. The movement of the electrons around the nucleus creates small magnetic regions. We call these regions magnetic domains and represent them by an arrow. The one end of the magnetic domain is called a north pole. This is represented by the arrow head. The other end, the south pole, is represented by the arrow tail. You can think of these regions as millions of tiny magnets inside each element. Inside any permanent magnet, the magnetic domains are all arranged in a very ordered manner. All the domains are aligned. This means that we can draw the little arrows all pointing in the same direction. This theory of magnetic domains is very useful. We can now investigate the question further as to how the poles of a magnet interact with each other. Let's join Aaron in the lab. Hey there guys, you know what? I'm sure you've seen something like this before. When I take this magnet here with the red north pole, put it on the table and take another magnet, it's red north pole, and put it close to it. Let's see what happens. They repel each other. The red pole is running away from the other red pole. Now we say that the red north poles have repelled each other. But if I take the blue south pole and put it close to the red north pole, see what happens. They attract. So we say that the red north pole and the south blue pole, they are attracted to each other. Well, now I'm going to repeat the same thing, but this time I use the blue south pole. Put it on the table, take another blue south pole and put it close to it and see what happens. They repel each other. Now we say that the blue south poles repel each other, they don't attract. Now I'm going to take the red north pole and put it close to this blue south pole and see what happens. They attract it. Well, could you summarize how magnets interact with each other? Right, magnetic poles of the same type, they repel each other, but opposite magnetic poles, they attract each other. Let's investigate further how the model of magnetic domains explains the question as to why some materials are magnetic and others are not. I hope you now understand that these two ends of a magnet are opposite in their nature. We call something with two opposite ends a dipole. In the elements on the periodic table, the magnetic domains are arranged in a random manner throughout a sample of the element, like here. These randomly arranged domains cancel each other out. There is no region that is distinctly like a north pole or a south pole. But interesting things happen inside these elements when they are brought close to a permanent magnet. Let's see if we can use our magnetic domain model to clarify the properties of magnetic and non-magnetic materials. When a permanent magnet is brought close to a non-magnetic material, like a piece of copper, the magnetic domains are not influenced by the magnet. They remain in their random arrangement.
Magnetic materials are attracted to magnets and can become magnetized. But let's look at the model of magnetic domain further to explain this behavior. Firstly, let's have a look at magnetic materials that have not been magnetized. Here, the magnetic domains are randomly arranged. This looks very similar to non-magnetic materials. But watch what happens when a magnet is brought close to this magnetic material. The magnetic domains change their arrangement and adopt the same arrangement as the magnetic domains in the magnet. This may be a temporary change, so when the magnet is removed, the domains again take on a random arrangement. But if a magnetic material is magnetized, the domains will be aligned like the magnets for a longer time. Do you see how the magnetic domain model shows us that a magnetic material becomes magnetized when all the magnetic domains inside a magnetic material align in the same direction, just like those in a permanent magnet to form two opposite poles? This idea has some very interesting consequences that need to be tested. The question I want you to think about very carefully is this. Is it possible to separate a north pole of a magnet from a south pole? Look very carefully at the model of magnetic domains while you are discussing this question. Let's go to the lab with Aaron and attempt to answer this question. Hey guys, I think I have an experiment that may answer your question. Have a look here. This magnet has been marked red on the north pole and blue on the south pole. Now I could just cut this magnet in between where the blue and the red meet, but how will I know which one is the North Pole and which one is the South Pole? Could you think of a way to identify the North Pole of a magnet? Remember, magnetic poles of the same type repel each other, but opposite magnetic poles attract each other. Now let's go back to our problem of trying to separate the North Pole from the South Pole. Now I've cut this bar magnet here in two halves. I've got now a red part and a blue part. Now, do you think that this red part is going to be North Pole on each side? Or will the one side be North Pole and the other side be South Pole? You know what? Why don't you write a prediction down and see if you're right? Okay, let's test it. Now, I've got both of my halves on the table here. But then I don't need to test this side here because it's the original North Pole. And I've done nothing on it to change it. But I need to test this side here, which I've cut. What I'm going to do is to take the red North Pole, bring it close to this new side here, and see what happens. It attracts. Now this means that the cut red end is the south pole. Now I'm going to take the same north pole, bring it to the cut side of the blue south pole and see what happens. It's running away. Now this means that the cut blue end is the north pole even though it's marked blue. So, what conclusions can we make? Can we separate the North Pole from the South Pole? Let's go back to the studio and see if the model of the magnetic domains confirms our results. Thanks, Aaron. That really helps a lot. Let's look at the model of magnetic domains again. Remember, these magnetic domains are tiny regions that are formed due to the arrangement of the electrons moving around the nucleus. In a magnet, the domains are all aligned, pointing in the same direction. So whenever I cut or break a magnet, the cut will be between some of these tiny magnetic domains. One side of the cut will always have an opposite pole to the other. This means that it is impossible to separate a north pole from a south pole. We've learned that a magnet is an object that has opposite poles and that magnets have many uses, including in sound systems and fridges. We also investigated some elements that have magnetic properties and how magnetic materials interact with each other. So that's all for today. Have a look on the Mindset Network for the task video that can be used for revision or to check your understanding of the topic. Also, look for more relevant videos on the same website at www.mindset.co.za forward slash learn. Goodbye.